sharing of medical devices or atrogenic hepatitis C is really quite common. Well, based on this epidemiology, the CDC in 1998 published guidelines on who should be screened. Anyone who has ever used injection drugs should be screened. Now, many people don't consider themselves injection drug users. This drug use may have been quite remote, as long as 30, 40 years ago. And oftentimes, people will feel that they did not have any medical consequences because they've been quite healthy. But as we'll talk about, hepatitis C does not make people feel sick. is also a risk factor that oftentimes requires asking the person about surgeries and possible risk exposures. Persons with hemophilia were universally infected before 1987. There is also a very high prevalence among those on renal dialysis, so screening should be a part of that situation. Having an ALT above the minimum normal is not normal, and this needs to be evaluated. Many patients that I see have an ALT that's in the 40 to 50 range. In fact, the majority of people with chronic hepatitis C have ALT levels below 75 and certainly below 100. These are not remarkable oftentimes when the chemistry panel returns. But any abnormal ALT is a recommendation from the CDC to screen for hepatitis C. And it certainly makes sense. They should not be written off to alcohol use or other potential causes. This is a recent screening algorithm updated from the CDC in February 2003. The algorithm that I would suggest be used. First, obviously trying to detect risk factors for disease. Now that means asking people about injection drug use, some of whom may be quite distant and may not consider themselves injection drug users. Also, purchase the abnormal liver enzymes. The first test is an antibody test. Now, the literature regarding first version or first generation antibodies in the early 90s was somewhat unreliable. But the third generation, EIA, is really quite sensitive and specific. Although with any screening test, it depends on the population tested. So if you're testing healthy donors, for example, volunteer blood donors, you will have false positives. But if you're testing a person who used ingestion drugs and has an abnormal ALT, it performs very well. Now what has changed a bit is what to do next. If you have a patient with a positive antibody, some guidelines would recommend doing a REBA. A REBA is akin to a Western blot for HIV. It tests antibodies to more antigens. In my view, there's very little role for this. A REBA is an antibody test. It does not, in fact, tell you if the person has chronic hepatitis C. What's important here is that among those who have positive antibody, some may have cleared infection within the first year of their infection. So you can have a positive antibody and not have chronic infection. The only way to distinguish chronic versus resolved hepatitis C is to perform RNA testing. So the next step that we would employ would be hepatitis C RNA testing following antibody. That tells you two things. Number one, it confirms your antibody. And number two, it confirms the presence of chronic viral hepatitis, chronic hepatitis C. In addition, as we'll talk about, it's the marker of treatment response. Now, the REBA may still have a role. In a person with no virus, it can tell you whether the antibody was a true positive or a false positive. So it may have some role. But the importance of this point is that RNA testing can be used as a confirmatory asset. We know that some people, after acute infection, will resolve their disease, as I mentioned. This can be as high as 15%. This is important to identify these people because, in fact, if they're repeatedly hepatitis C RNA negative by PCR, they can be told they do not have chronic hepatitis C, they do not need treatment, and are not at risk for liver disease. Unfortunately, most have chronic hepatitis. And it's said that 20% of these persons will progress to cirrhosis within 20 years. The problem is, that's a population statistic. It doesn't really tell you about the patient sitting in front of you. We have an extraordinary amount of difficulty in predicting for an individual human being whether they will progress to have cirrhosis or will have hepatitis C that remains relatively stable. They have been associated with rapid progression. Alcohol use, two drinks a day or about 20 grams of alcohol has been associated with rapid progression of disease. The best advice and one supported by many experts in hepatitis C is that if you're hepatitis C infected, you should not use any alcohol except for perhaps a drink on a special occasion, as long as they don't occur too frequently. Now the other thing that has been associated with progression is HIV. I won't spend a lot of time talking about this point, but HIV is associated with an eight-fold greater risk of progression to end-stage liver disease. And when we look at patients today being treated with highly effective HIV therapy, 
liver disease did hepatitis C has emerged as either the leading or second leading cause of death of HIV infected patients in the developed world where treatments are available. So very clearly our goal of intervention is to prevent cirrhosis and if cirrhosis has occurred to prevent progression to liver cancer and liver failure. And really, these are the outcomes we hope to achieve, and the best predictor is a viral outcome. We'll talk more about that. But although we can measure viral loads, hepatitis C viral load is not prognostic. A viral load that's high, say perhaps 10 million international units, does not necessarily mean that that subject or that patient has a bad liver. ALT does not also correlate well with findings on biopsy. So if you really want to ask the question, how bad is the hepatitis C, and does my patient need treatment, today we still rely on liver biopsy to stage the disease and is an important tool. Now there are efforts to identify non-invasive serum markers of hepatic fibrosis, and these have been published. Terry Poignard published a series in The Lancet about a year and a half ago, and these are reasonably effective in depicting mild versus cirrhotic disease, but they don't at this point replace liver biopsy. And in fact, when we look at the things that have been associated with progression, we find that older age is associated with more progression, longer duration of infection, men tend to progress more than women, iron overload, whether it be hemochromatosis or secondary iron overload, alcohol, co-infection with B and HIV. But when you sit and think about a patient with hepatitis C, these factors really can't lead you to a good decision about where they stand. So again, we still rely on liver biopsy. I want to point out, however, again, that viral load should not be used to prognosticate nor to decide who should be treated. Now, we primarily treat patients to prevent progression of liver disease, but I do want to mention a couple of important points. The first is vasculitis, typically due to immune complex disease or chronic globulinemia. This is a relatively rare phenomenon that occurs in some patients with hepatitis C. They develop cryoglobulins that can lead to membranous gland nephritis, vasculitis, and some very interesting reports, actually a recent report in New England Journal of Medicine. Field. I'm Staff Sergeant Armando Aparicio, Jr. 